Hello everybody and welcome to Exceptional Family TV. Today we're having a special episode where we're going to talk with Robin and Taylor through Skype. We're going to talk with them about living with Asperger's. Robin and Taylor, thank you so much for, for joining us and taking the time to uh, talk with us today. Tell me, at, uh, you know, at the start of Taylor's life, what, uh, what, was, what was life like? Normal baby? Very normal. Well, we started seeing something and really being aware of it at uh, two, but we can look back now and see that she really got started getting sick at one. And when did you start noticing certain concerning behavior, enough to say, okay, well, what, what's going on here? We, we need a diagnosis from a doctor. It was, it was definitely it, too. Um, you know, you, you have the sense of um, a mother's intuition that something's wrong, and when you can actually put your voice to the concerns, everyone says, oh, don't worry, Einstein didn't talk until so-and-so. And, but for us, it was... Um, she had lost skills that she was actually having at, a, at the year one mark. Um, you know, the, the mama, dada, some of those things, the, the eye contact, those kinds of things, those were gone by two. So um, I knew she was regressing and I just, I just knew. What did the doctor say? Was it a pediatrician? Did you have to go to a neurologist? We went to a specialist and we specifically, you know, got diagnosis, we got evaluations. We did all of that right off, right off the board, off the bat. So you got a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, and what? Uh, how did that? How did that affect Taylor? Well, back then it wasn't Asperger's syndrome. It was on the autism spectrum. It was autism. They said you don't fully fit it, but Asperger's hadn't really been, you know, tossed around very much at that point. That was actually much later that we we came to that term. Um, so we were told that she was 50% across the board. That she might never talk. That she might never go to um, a regular school, she might um, not be able to be in inclusion. They just didn't know. They really were very clear. Uh, it was very frustrating because you didn't know if they didn't know or they just wouldn't tell you. So how did it affect her? Like how, how the things that did you notice? Um, it was uh, the, the eye contact. We could have a whole banquet of food uh, in front of us and on her you know tray at that point she was still sitting in a high chair she could just have a cracker and she wouldn't even look at the other food she wouldn't ask for it she didn't point the only thing she ever did to communicate an interest was get her coat because she wanted to go outside so I knew there was that communication itself was a real problem besides the fact that there weren't words and Taylor do you remember any of this when you were young around the, that two to four year age range I do. I remember, like, for example, once when I was in therapy, I remember that I knew what the people were asking of me. I had to ask. There was a swing there, and I had to ask to continue the ride on the swing. And I knew they were asking that, but I, I don't know why now, but I just knew I couldn't respond. I knew what they were asking, but I, I just couldn't respond. And it frustrated me to no end, and I went into one of those series of screeching, a lot of what you would associate with autism, and I think that's a lot of the root of it, is the frustration those kids have. And at what, at what point did you kind of realize that, you know, things, things were wrong? Myself, wow. Uh, I've always been different than the other kids, and I always just thought, I'm different. You know, I'm different. You know, when you're five, six, seven years old, you, you don't have, you can't really recognize you know, like autism, you know, you have no awareness of that, you're just a kid. And it was until I was 9, 10, 11 that I realized, you know, I'm diagnosably different. I'm not just a weird kid. I always thought I was just a weird kid, but I'm, you know, <laughs> you know, there's always the weird kid, especially in the TV shows. I thought I just fit that profile, but then when I, when I started getting a bit more aware, I realized, okay, you know, I'm really different. And Robin, as a parent, were you very open with Taylor about the diagnosis and, and kind of the, the label, as, as some parents put it? Yeah, and I, I get asked this question a lot by parents is, you know, when do you tell them? And, and what I said is, you know, my, the way I approach it is we all have different abilities, skills, different kinds of minds, brains, that sort of thing. And, uh, and this is what yours is called. And so it was just approached as we're all different and this is, your, this is your set of skills and your set of challenges. So it wasn't like I sat her down and said, Taylor, you have a diagnosis. You know, it was just, this is, this is you. What was the turning point for you? For me, I, I start remember, my first memory as being an aware 
person. And I think that's the turning point for me is when I'm not just stuck in that other world and I'm starting to realize myself as a person. And I say I felt that way for the first time in uh, first grade, I'd say. Because preschool, I have some vague memories, but it's, but it's very just like all mush. There's no consciousness behind it almost. And I'd say first grade was the first time where I realized I had an awareness, you know, of consequences and things like that. I could function like closer to much a normal person. So with this um, other world that you say that it is, what is that? How would you it's, explain what that is? It's literally a different world and what I do is I pace to access it and I lose all consciousness in terms of being aware of my world and being aware of this world, sorry. Um, I am renowned for running into things, I am renowned for just falling, because my, my presence in this world just shuts off. And that world is literally another version of planet Earth. There's no, none of the people that exist here exist there. They're 100% made up characters. It's almost like a fantasy world. But everything goes the way I says it. I, I say it goes, you know. It's my own rules, and it's I don't exist in it, but I have characters, and I experience the world from their perspective. And I think they might be subconscious symbols of my psyche. You know, there's a lot of psychology I think that can go into that. But pretty much, it's a fantasy existence, another dimension. Consciously speaking, you're not seeing what we would consider the real world. It's you are completely in. Completely gone. Okay. What could someone bring you out of it? Oh yeah, I get brought out of it with any visual stimulus. Like if something moves, I'm immediately brought out of it. There's still that subconscious part of my mind that kind of detects danger. Like, you know, if you're sleeping and something moves near you or there's a loud noise, you'll wake up. There's still that amount of consciousness. But as far as if no one bothers me, I don't know where I am. Sometimes I'll end up in a room I didn't know I was in. We scare her pretty often. We we go into we go into our own room and we find her pacing there. And she's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> they have a wonderful website, meettaylormorris.com. I watched all your videos. Um, in them, you, you talked about when you were younger, your your mom, you know, taught you certain social skills. Can you tell me what that was like and may, maybe a specific um, analogy that you that you remember from that? I would say that what she taught me most was forcing me to realize consequences. Because I think the issue for a lot of autistic people is because of their special needs and because of how much of personalized attention they get, they lose the awareness of that they're just one person in this world. And my mom, you know, she she made me accountable. If I said something rude, you know, she would make me make me realize it by saying, you know, you hurt that person's feelings, you know. And it made me realize that I'm a part of this world. I'm not just me. I'm not I'm not trapped. I am a part of this world. And I think that's what really helped. And Robin, do you have maybe specific advice that you could give for other parents who might be going through the same thing? Well, I think um, you know, for us everything is always trial and error as as far as what actually works. But she um she really gives me good feedback on that. I can see if something works or not. She really wants to get along. She wants to not be offensive. She wants to, you know, do the things that need to be done for her to fit in, all of those kinds of things. So, so really just going very logically. Logic is huge for the Aspie mind. Learning how they learn and realizing that she's not going to get nuance. And, uh, and she can get her feelings hurt, but it won't necessarily show, so you have to work around that. Um, and really just looking at all the different ways in which we can try to get something through to her and, and offer her those different ways instead of having her conform to how we do it. And just, you know, I really don't believe that beating, you know, beating them into doing it the way we want them to do it is actually going to work. Um, and I also don't think it's, it's very kind. Um, so kindness is a big thing too, I think.